this crossroads thing in my heart, um, I never really... I never really looked at some of these situations before. There's so many situations in the Bible. The Lord uses so many different people in so many different situations as illustrations uh, to show us right, wrong, to see people's weaknesses, to pe see people's strengths, to see the frailties in humankind. Listen, there's nothing new under the sun. You know, we all have issues. We all have problems. And we really get an opportunity to try to learn from some of these situations and these crossroads situations. Um, I'm going to actually preach out of a passage I've never preached out of before this morning as a pastor. I've been doing this since 1993-ish. I've um, been doing this a while, but I've never preached out of this passage before. Uh, but we're going to uh, talk about Lot and Lot's wife today is what we're going to talk about. Talk about a crossroads situation. And so anyway, let's go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 19. I'm going to go ahead and turn there, verse 1. Um, listen, here, let me give you some backstory. Abraham had been sent out by God to go to the promised land. He brought his relative with him, Lot, and uh, they grew and grew and grew, and they had to split apart. The two families had to split apart because they grew too big, and the land wouldn't support their, their families and their herds and their flocks and all of that. They had, so they had to split apart and go two different directions. And Lot chose to go one direction, Abraham chose to go another direction. Lot got first dibs. He gave him first dibs. So Lot got to choose where he wanted to go. And Lot chose this particular direction. What Lot chose was to settle his family in a little town you might have heard of called Sodom. That's what Lot chose. And so anyway, he, he set his family here in this place. Now, just go ahead and get this out of the way. Sodom was known for a few things, right? Okay. Sodom was known for a culture that to God was like a not a godly culture. It was known for all kind of things. And it, it like the outcry of all of that rose to heaven. That's what they actually said. Said the, the sin of that city had risen to heaven and it had gotten God's attention. And it wasn't just that one city. There was actually five cities there that God came down to deal with, Sodom being one of those, being one of the primary. And so, anyway, it was known for its moral corruption and deviant sexual practices. That's what it was known for. It was known for all kind of wonderful, good stuff. And so, anyhow, <laughs> what I want you to also know is that at this point, when we're going to take up the scripture in just a second, what you, what you need to know is that Lot had already been rescued by Abraham one time. He'd already been there in this city, and the city had been overrun, and they'd been taken off captive, and he'd already come, Abraham had already come and rescued Lot one time. So he'd already gotten him, God had already gotten him out of that situation and rescued him one time, and now we go and look and find out that Lot is right back in the same situation that he was in to start with. Anybody besides me ever done that, like going back into messed up situations where God's already delivered me out of it to start with? Is it just me? Okay, well, I'm in the right place. Anyhow, and you got the right pastor. So <laughs> we can kind of relate there. So anyway, so Lot finds himself back in this same messed up situation. And the angel of the Lord, if you look in your, if you look in your Bibles many times, many of your versions, the phrase angel of the Lord is capitalized. You know, what that is, is Jesus is the angel of the Lord. And he's showing up. It's called a theophany. It's when Jesus shows up in the Old Testament pre uh, him coming as a baby. So it's actually Jesus is showing up as the angel of the Lord. He comes with two angels, and he's coming down to handle business. He's coming down to deal with this thing and to handle business. And so he tells Abraham, he asks his angel, say, hey, should we tell Abraham what we're going to do here, or should we hide it from him? Seeing as he's going to be a great nation, we're going to, he's going to be a great prince, we're going to make a great nation out of him. Should we hide it from him or should we tell him? They decide to tell him. And so they tell him that they're coming down and they're going to bring uh, judgment on these five cities. And Abraham, you know he's sitting there thinking, man, that's where Lot is. That's where, my, that's where my nephew Lot is. That's where my boy's at. What am I going to do? So he starts to negotiate with God. <laughs> Any of y'all ever been there before, been in a bad situation, you try to start negotiating with God? Um, hey, Lord, what if... Uh... <laughs> well, Abraham was one of the only successful people that's ever negotiated with God. He negotiated successfully. However, 
he fell a little short. He should have kept going. So he starts negotiation, negotiating. He said, hey, what if there's, you know, this many people? What if there's this many righteous people? Surely you're not going to bring destruction and judgment here because of this many people, because of the this many righteous people. No, I won't. Well, if it's that many people, you know, what about like 50? Is 50, is 50 cool? Is 50 good? Um, uh, yeah, no problem. Okay, well, if 50 is cool, what about, you know, like 20? 20 good? 20? 20? Can I hear 20? 20? 20? Going once? 20? Going 20? 20, 20, 25? 25? What about 25? <laughs> is there 20? Yeah. Okay. Well, listen, Lord, surely if there's 10 righteous people there, you're not going to destroy the city on account of them. Okay, fine. If there's 10, you know, God's omniscient. He knows everything, right? He already knows there's not 10. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll let her go for 10. What is the point you can take out of that? Well, sometimes you may be in an unrighteous situation and you're the only thing that's keeping the wrath of God from coming on the situation because you're righteous. Maybe you're salt and light and the Lord has put you there to change the atmosphere of the situation. Maybe that. Just saying that was free. That wasn't even in the message. Anyhow, <laughs> so he does Abraham this favor. He does Abraham this favor. He says, listen, I'm going to go get Lot and I'm going to get him out of this city. I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to do you a solid. I know that, um, that he's already been rescued out of this situation once. He evidently liked it because he went back to it. And so I'm going to get him and his family out on your behalf because you're a righteous guy. And so anyway, he, he loves him, and he goes and he does him this favor, and he gets him out. You know, many times, many times on account of other people, I really believe that God has spared in my life. When I look back over my life, I look back over situations that God has spared me grief and I honestly believe spared my life in a few situations on behalf of other people that were praying for me. You have people in your life that you love, that live in, in messed up situations, that live in the middle of hell. You're praying for them. You're interceding for them. Maybe the only thing that's keeping them breathing and an opportunity to get to know Jesus. So I'm just saying, keep praying. Keep praying. If there's somebody you're believing for that hadn't found Jesus yet, hadn't met Jesus yet, keep praying. Keep pushing forward. Keep praying. So here's the other thing. Oftentimes people, because of your prayers maybe even, get opportunities. Oftentimes before I met Jesus, I had opportunities. And I squandered those opportunities. But as long, what's the, what's the point? As long as you're still breathing or as long as they're still breathing, there's hope. There's hope. Keep praying. Just keep pushing for it. Let's pray and we'll move on. Lord Jesus, I just thank you today that you would help us as we pick up here in this story. Lord, that you would help us to see this crossroads situation. That you would help us to understand that, Lord, there are times in our lives, Lord, that we all have issues. Lord, we're not sitting here pointing a finger at a, a particular city or whatever, Lord. We're, we are using it as an illustration to help us understand, Lord, it's not just the culture that we're talking about. It's situations. And, Lord, every one of us have found ourselves in messed up situations before of our own making, of our own doing. Lord, we all have our own sins that we particularly uh, gravitate to, our own issues that we particularly gravitate to. Lord, help us to find in this situation, when you're calling us out, when you open the door for us to go in a crossroads situation, help us to see, Lord, what we need to do and how we need to act. I love you, Lord. Amen. And all right, Genesis chapter 19. We're going to go down this passage of Scripture, and uh, I'm just going to go through it. And as I go through it, I'm going to stop, and we're going to make some points. So here Abraham is. Uh, he's met these angels, and these angels are headed over to Sodom, and they're going to get Lot out for Abraham on Abraham's behalf. So Genesis chapter 19, we're going to pick up in verse 1. It says, the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. There's a couple of things you need to know here. Number one, Sodom uh, was, we've already talked about what kind of city it was, what kind of culture it had. Uh, it had, had an ungodly culture. But there's some things here in this one passage that's really, really crazy. It says Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. There's some things you need to know about the gate of the city. When the Bible talks about the gate of a city. The gate of the city is a defensive mechanism. A gate of a city is not an offensive mechanism. There's some offensive tools and things that are used there, but primarily the gate of a city is a defensive mechanism. It's like setting up a point and saying, okay, 
you can come this far and no further. It's, it's like if they had a siege, that's the, that's the defense. That's the first line of defense of the city. They would set up a gate and prevent anybody from coming into the city. So it was a, a place to uh, disallow access or to control access. It was a place to where they can look and say, okay, you can come in here and you cannot. A gate is always a defensive mechanism. It's like when Jesus said uh, uh, on the revelation, when he was talking about the revelation of who he was as Messiah, he said, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But what you need to understand in that scripture, Jesus is not picturing hell as on the offensive after the poor little Christians who are going to get eaten up. What Jesus is picturing, he said, I'll build my church, and my church is going to be so bad that it will kick in the gates of hell. That's what he's saying. We need to live like that. That's how we need to live. And so the gates of hell are pictured as on the defense for the advancing church. That's what it's pictured as. And so the church that Jesus builds will always be on the advance, never on the defensive. So anyhow, that was also pretty good. <laughs> so the other thing I want you to understand about the gates of the city, the gates of the city, when it, the Bible refers to that, often it's also talking about the government, the government of the city. Because what would happen is the elders of the city would come and they would sit at the gates and they would make decisions, they would make judgments. People would come and, uh, and, and buy parcels of land from others and they would go for witnesses to the government at the gates of the city. That's what they would do. And so, um, you know, you think of uh, Ruth. When she was redeemed, what, was it Boaz? Yeah, when she, I had to think for a second. Who were they? <laughs> when, she was, when she was redeemed, Boaz went to the gate of the city to the elders and redeemed her property and redeemed her in that from one of her relatives. He actually took off his shoe and gave it to him and said, this is a witness between you and all these guys. So the gates of the city represent the government of the city. So two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in a place of influence in the government of Sodom. Lot was integrated into the life of Sodom. So much so, he was part of the government of the city. Lot wasn't in a messed up situation. Lot was part of the messed up situation. There's a difference. He wasn't just an innocent bystander. Lot was all in, in a cheerleader for the situation. So he was at an all-in situation. So he's sitting in that gate. He'd become a part of the fabric and a part of the culture of Sodom. He had adopted Sodom as his home city. Those were his people, and that was his, uh, that was his fabric. So Lot was a decision maker and a person of note in the Sodomite culture. That was who Lot was. Lot wasn't just in Sodom. Sodom was in Lot. There's a difference. And so, anyway, it's a heart matter. It was in his heart. So I believe Lot had compromised. See, Lot knew the same God that Abraham knew. But I believe that Lot had compromised who he was and what he knew to be able to fit in and, 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 and to fit in and not offend the culture around him. We have to be careful in the church. We have to be careful in the church. We talk about very much about um, being able to speak to culture. There's this whole thing about being relevant. We want to be relevant to culture, and the gospel is relevant. It's always relevant. It's been relevant from day one. It'll be relevant the day that Jesus splits the clouds and come back. The day after, it will seem very much relevant to people who didn't. It's irrelevant. So, it is definitely relevant. We want to be able to speak to culture as a church. We want culture to be able to hear us, um, but we don't want to be defined by culture. We don't want to be formed by culture. We don't want culture to dictate what the church is. The church needs to be the change agent to culture. The culture doesn't need to be the change agent to the church. But we do need for people to be able to hear what we're saying. You know, that's the reason we do music the way that we do it. That's the way we, and people say, well, you're being, you're being changed by culture. Okay, well, we just need to do hymns, don't we? Well, let's think about it. John and Charles Wesley, they did hymns. A lot of the hymns that they did, um, they were, you know, they wrote these standards that we love. You know where they got some of the tunes for their hymns? They were bar tunes that they changed the words to. 
Are you trying to tell, what? why in the world would they do that? They were trying to be relevant to the people they were trying to meet. They were trying to let people be able to hear and to listen. I don't speak King James English. King James Version is a fantastic translation, but it's not the end all be all. Sorry, that offends you. Jesus loves you anyhow. Um, but I don't speak King James English. I don't really understand it. But we do teach out of a literal translation. We do teach out of verbatim literal translation. Why? So you can understand it. You don't speak King James English either. You don't. So there's something to be said for culture being at least able to understand what you're saying, but not be changed in our hearts, formed in our hearts by what culture said is, is right and wrong. Cultural norms. So anyhow, I believe Lot had compromised who he was and what he believed. So we need to be salt and light. We don't need to lose our savor. We don't need to lose our flavor. We need to be salt and light. We don't need to be found to be people in our lives as individuals to compromise. If God sends you into an ungodly situation, that situation doesn't need to compromise who you are. You need to be the light in that situation. You don't need to dim your light in an ungodly situation so that you can fit in with all the other dim lights. You need to let your light shine before men about, about who God is, is in you. I talked about that this morning. You know, Jesus is alive. He just needs to be alive in us. Right? So, anyway, we're to bring good news to culture. We're to be the change agents to culture, not be changed by culture. All right, moving on. Now that I've preached on that one half of a verse right there. Moving on. <laughs> when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, My lords, please turn aside your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. He hopped on up and he ran to them. He recognized something was different. Maybe something about them from where he came from. He recognized. He said, wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. They said, no, nah, we'll spend the night in the town square. Pressed them strongly. He pressed them strongly. <laughs> so now we'll spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly. So they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread. And they ate. Baked them unleavened bread. And they ate. Got a question. Why do you think Lot chose to press them strongly? Hey, no, nah, man, it's all good. No, nah, I don't want to put you out. We're going to hang out here. In the square. We'll spend a night out here, Lot. No, no, listen, no. You guys need to come on in here. We're gonna, I'm gonna bake some bread. It's gonna be good. I got a rotisserie chicken from Walmart. It's cool. Y'all come on in here. We're gonna eat. If I need to get another rotisserie chicken from Walmart, we'll go down and do what we need to do and maybe a pumpkin pie or something. I don't know. But they're gonna feast. We're gonna eat. And we're gonna, no, nah, come in here. Why do you think he pressed them so strong not to stay in the square? He'd at least been a silent witness to what had happened before. And he saw it coming. You know, it's like a train wreck you can't take your eyes off of. You know it's fixing to happen. There's nothing you can do to change it. But it's like being a silent witness. Lot had at least been a silent witness to what was going to try to be transpired. He'd seen it before, lots before. So... He at least been a silent witness to what had happened to strangers in Sodom before. He knew plans were already being initiated towards these men. Let's pick up in verse 4. It says, But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man. Now, how many is left? None of them, because it's all the people to the last man. So, so much for ten righteous, right? So much, is, and ten righteous is not ten because all the men are here engaged in this thing. And they called a lot. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us. Bring them out to us that we may know them. I'm looking around to see who's in here and how old they are. Y'all in big boy church, it's all good. Bring them out to us that we may know them. Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him and said, I beg you, my brothers. I beg you, my brothers. You want proof that Lot was engaged in the culture of the city? Those are his brothers. 
I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. If you want to understand what these men wanted to do, they wanted to know them in the biblical sense. All the men of the city. They wanted to rape these men is what they wanted to do. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to rape these men. My, and my brothers? My, my brothers? You identify with this? This is cool, would you like? You know what it makes me wonder? If last time strangers came to the city, if Lot was one of them standing outside the house. That's what it makes me wonder. I can't prove that, but you can't prove I'm wrong. Can't prove or disprove it. I beg you, my brothers, they wanted to take by force intimacy from these men. Rape is about control. It's not primarily about sex. It's primarily about control, I really believe. They wanted to control the situation. Listen, oftentimes, I'm going to flip this on you. Oftentimes in an ungodly culture, in an ungodly situation, that situation is designed to take some things from you by force. It's designed to take your purpose. It's designed to take by force your destiny. It's designed to take by force your calling. It's designed to take some things that are very intimate to you by force. An ungodly culture is designed to take your sense of right and wrong and twist it by force. An ungodly situation is designed to take your identity by force. It wants to take your faith in God by force. Why? Because if it can take who you are, it makes you ineffective. If it, it, can, it can totally control and make you ineffective. It's about control. I know this is a pretty strong message this morning. It's okay. This wasn't the one Jesus gave me. So it wants to take your faith in God. It wants to conform you to its belief system. An ungodly situation, an ungodly, uh, even if you deal with an ungodly person, they want to take from you many times what you believe and impose what they believe on you. That's called taking by force. It wants to take your sense of right and wrong. It wants you to endorse. An ungodly culture wants to take your sense of right and wrong because it wants you to endorse what culture said is cultural norm. That's what it wants to do. It wants to take your identity. It wants you to become one of us. Become one of my brothers, but you have to embrace what we embrace and like what we like and change what you are to conform to us. Ungodly culture wants to impose, an ungodly situation even, even wants to impose by force itself as your final authority. It wants to become your God. It wants to become your God. I think I've said enough about that. Moving on. Verse 8. <laughs> so behold, here's Lot's answer. This is the most upsetting part of it for me. Behold, I have two daughters. Who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you. And do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men. For they've come under the shelter of my roof. I understand the concept of they were under his protection. Because they were under his roof. I understand that that means that you. I understand. Especially in, in Middle Eastern cultures. There's this thing where. When you come under their roof. That listen they'll fight you to the last man. To protect the person that's come under their roof. They're, they'll do it. If you ever read Marcus Luttrell's book. That happened to him. He was very thankful for that. That sense of honor. But here's my two daughters. Do to them as you choose. My two, my two virgin daughters. Who've never known a man. You just do to them. What? That's twisted. I got, that's, that's messed up. I mean, I would have come out and had some things to say, but it wouldn't have been, hey, here's my two daughters, have them and do what you want. If any of you know me, I would have probably answered the door in a slightly different manner. Yeah, anyhow, <laughs> bandolier style, it would have been, anyhow, maybe I watched too many John Wayne movies when I was a kid. I don't know. It would have been a different scenario, I can promise. <laughs> so anyhow, this is just a horrible compromise to me. It's just a horrible, 
Interesting how when you deal with an ungodly culture, they want you to make horrible compromises, isn't it? You ever been forced into a situation to make a horrible compromise? Mm. Messed up, messed up. Here's the thing. No matter how much you give in an ungodly situation, in an ungodly messed up culture, in an ungodly, no matter how much you give, it is never enough. The answer to compromise, even though it's a horrible compromise, is more. I want more. You have to give more. Well, what if we do this? Nope, has to be more. I'm glad you gave that. That's great. Now we want more. We want more until you're conformed into the image of cultural norms. Ungod- when you're in a crossroads situation, understand compromise does not work. It's like trying to negotiate with a terrorist. Why? Because they always want more. Generally speaking, we don't negotiate with terrorists. At least we didn't used to. We don't negotiate with terrorists. Why? Because they always want more. There's only one thing a terrorist understands. The same way I would have answered the door. Anyhow, you can't compromise because the enemy of your soul is never satisfied. Not until you're conformed into his image. Why? Because he wants to be God. The enemy of your soul wants to be God. So he comes out, verse 9. He says, but they say, stand back. But they said, stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn. He came to hang out. And he's become the judge. He really had. He had been sitting in the gate of the city. They just didn't like his judgment at that time. He's become the judge. Now we'll deal worse with you than with them. What they planned for them was already pretty bad. I don't know. I mean, we'll deal worse with you than with them. How dare you say that we're wrong? We took you in, and when you compromised, and you said that you endorsed everything we want to do, last time you were here out here at the front of the house with us, and now you can become a judge over us? Oh, we're going to make you pay. It's amazing how when you deal with ungodly culture, when you deal with an ungodly situation, if you ever make a stand, they're going to try to make you pay. It is what it is. You don't like what we think? You're going to endorse what? We're going to make you pay. We're going to make you endorse what we believe. We're going to make you. It's not just a matter of make you, uh, make you accept what we believe. We want you to endorse what we believe. We want you to change. And if you don't, we're going to make it worse for you than for them. We're going to make you pay. Make you pay for your lack of endorsement. It says, then they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break the door down. And here's where the script flips. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great. So that they wore themselves out groping for the door. Hold on. Let me see if I can get this right. So they're out there trying to break into the house. Lot gets snatched back in the house. The angels strike them with blindness. And they're still trying to get in? They're groping around blind and can't see, trying to get in and break into the house? They were dedicated. you got to give them that. Deceived and dedicated. How many times have you been in a situation where God just like does something miraculous and you think, well, that's it, but it keeps on pushing. It keeps on moving forward. It keeps on, keeps on pushing. So they wore themselves out groping for the door. Then the men said to Lot, have you got anybody else here? Maybe that's, sorry, that's Southeast Georgia. I don't know where that came from. I didn't even read it. It said, (laughs) have you anyone else here? Sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anything, or anyone you have in this city, bring them out of this place, for we're about to destroy this place. Because the outcry against his people has become so great before the Lord, and the Lord sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, where? Right outside the door where they were with every man who had gathered in the city. He went out to his sons-in-law, who moments before had been part of the crowd that were offered to, to do as they will to the two people they were engaged to. Maybe part of the same crowd that was struck blind trying to get in. So, so Lot was so immersed in that culture, so immersed in it, he even didn't have anything, 
in his head or in his heart that said, listen, you don't want to give your daughters to this. To this, these two men that are outside the door. Mm. Anyway, do you see that? Does that mess you up? Do you, do you see that? So, he <laughs> said, anyway, he went out and, and said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy this city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. There's some things, people that date my daughters. There's a certain standard that I have for them. <laughs> These guys here didn't meet it. Anyhow, so he was so invested in that system, it was, it was like he was willing to give his daughters there. But it says, as morning dawned, the angels heard Lot saying, Up, take your wife, your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of your city. But he lingered. But he lingered. So the city had been judged by God. He knew that this was a dangerous and terminal situation. Lot knew this was a dangerous and terminal situation. He knew his family had been spared, and not because of his own righteousness. Guarantee he knew he was spared because of he knew he was spared because of Abraham. So he knew he'd been spared for all of this, but he still didn't want to get out. You ever been in a situation that you knew you shouldn't have been in, shouldn't have been in to start with, should have never been there. You knew the situation was messed up. You knew it was going to heck in a handbasket. You knew it was fixing to blow up. It was super volatile. You knew it was a messed up, ungodly situation. But you still wanted to be there. You still wanted to linger. I know I'm not supposed to be here doing this. I know what I'm doing here with this individual is straight ungodly. I know it's wrong. But I just like it too much to go. I just like it too much. It just feels too good to my carnality to want to go. I just, I just need to stay just one more day. I just need one more hit. I just need to hang out with this individual one more time. I just need... Sometimes you just have to go. In a crosswords, crossroads situation... Sometimes it's just best to get up when you're being saved out of a situation, redeemed out of a situation. Sometimes it's just best to go. Sometimes we just need to go. Anyhow, I've acted like that before. I don't know if you ever had. I have. When God has brought you out of a situation and redeemed you and made the way obvious, sometimes you just need to take what you can grab and go. Sometimes you don't need to take anything. So, it says, so he was, uh, he was lingering. It says, so the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, and the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. And as they brought them out, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. And Lot said to them, Oh, no, my lords. Oh, no, hold on, wait a minute. Oh, no, no, my lords. Get out. Don't look back. Go to the hills. Hit the bricks, son. In my paraphrase. Anyway, hit the bricks. Go. Oh, no, my lords. Behold, your servant has found favor in your sight. And you've shown me great kindness in saving my life. But. But always gets in the way, doesn't it? But. I appreciate all you've done for me. But. But. Listen, sometimes it's best just not negotiate. Just take the instructions and go. You show me this great kindness in saving my life, but I cannot escape to the hills lest a disaster overtake me and I die. Dude, if you stay where you're at, that's exactly what's going to happen. Behold, this city, this city is near enough to flee to, and it's, a little, it's just a little city. This city is a little one. Let me escape there. Is this not a little city? It's just a little city. And my life will be saved. And he said to them, Behold, I grant you this favor also, that I will not overthrow the city of which you've spoken. Escape there quickly, for I can do nothing until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. Zoar was one of the five cities that was originally designated to be destroyed. It wasn't destroyed. It wasn't destroyed. Zoar here represents compromise. Listen, I appreciate it, and I know you got me out of here, and you saved my life, and you saved my daughter's lives and my wife's life, and I appreciate it, but listen, I really don't want to go all the way out. I just want to leave part of the way. 
I don't want to leave all five of these cities behind. I just want to go to this little place of compromise. I just want to go to this little city. Listen, this is just a small thing. Listen, I used to do all of this, that, and the other. You know, man, I, I used to, listen, I just, <laughs> man, I came out of, 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 it's like somebody that came out of, it's like somebody that came out of um, intravenous drugs and cocaine and smoking meth or whatever, but they say, listen, I'm almost all the way out, but I just want to smoke weed. I hope that's okay. I'm, I'm part of the way out, but I just want to break it down real for you. That's where it's at. When we're in a situation where we've been redeemed, when you settle for a compromise, you are playing on the edges of fire. And when you play on the edges of fire, you're going to get burned. It's going to happen. You're going to get burned. When you play on the edges of what's acceptable, you know, this, it's like, what must I do to be saved? It's like, what's the minimum I have to do? When you play on the edges of your bad situation, on your addiction, on your, when you play around the edges of it, you're going to get pulled back into it. That's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. There's, there's, it's just a messed up. If I hang out on the fringes of my past, I'm bound to get sucked back into it. If I hang out on the fringes of my past, I'm bound to get sucked back into it. Verse 23. And the sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar, and the Lord reigned in Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur and fire from heaven, from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the city and what grew on the ground, but Lot's wife behind him. Lot's wife behind him. You should have been paying more attention to what was going on. Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he looked and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. So it was that uh, God destroyed the cities of the valley. God remembered Abraham and sent out Lot of the midst of the overthrow. Then he overthrew the cities which Lot dwelt in. Lot chose to live his life in a situation that corrupted him. And not only did it corrupt him, it corrupted his family. Not only had, not only had that ungodly situation gotten into him, it got into his family as well. You, if you keep reading, you'll see later on it also got into his daughters. It was an ungodly situation. What you do, where, where you choose to live your life, where I choose to live my life, the situations that I choose to live my life in, not only affect me, it affects my children. A state of whatever, a state of, a state of addiction, a state of depression, a state of anxiety, a state of, uh, of, of an ungodly living situation, whatever. I can live my life in a negative situation. And if I have my family there, it doesn't just affect me. It affects them. It's called a generational curse. It passes down if you choose to live there. That can be broken through the power of Jesus. But you have to make a decision not to live in compromise. You have to make a decision not to do that. And so his wife looked back. Man, how many times have I looked back? How many times have I done that? How many times has the Lord brought me out of a situation and I look back? What was it I remember so fondly about that jacked up situation? You ever been in a situation when you finally do get delivered out of it? You go, what in the heck was I thinking? That's the situation. The thing is, is it cost him his wife. It cost him his wife. Might not have been a big deal to him, though. He was willing to give up his two daughters. Been a big deal to me. Listen. When you're brought out, when the Lord brings you out of a messed up situation, we have to allow God to get out of us what needs to be gotten out of us. We don't need to just allow God to get us out of the situation. We need to allow to get out of us the situation, what the situation put into us called deliverance it's called being set free what we carry with us into a new season from the old season can kill you it can destroy everything it's not just about getting out of the situation it's about getting the situation out of us 
So when we make the decision finally to go, we also need to make the decision to let Jesus set us free. It can kill us just as easily here as it did there. Crossroads. Here's a net, net, net. Ready? Five practical points. When we find ourselves sitting in the gate, when we find ourselves sitting in the gate, in a situation where we're not just a victim of a bad situation anymore, we're now part of it. We're now perpetuating it. When we find ourselves sitting in the gate, remember where you came from. Remember. You know, if the Lord has done things for you before, remember that there's a God out there that loves you, who wants more for your life. He wants more for you. He has more for you. There's more for us than just a life of compromise. Number two, when God shows up to get us out, when God shows up to get us out, cut our losses and go. Some investments are bad investments. Sell them and do something else. Cut your losses now and go. Some situations, some, re some relationships, some situations, some are just, you just need to cut your losses and go. Leave it and get out. Why? Because there's nothing here worth my life. There's nothing I have in an ungodly situation that's destined for destruction, and you know there's nothing here that's worth my life. Number three, when we're at the crossroads of deliverance, decide to run. Don't linger. <laughs> Don't linger over the situation. Don't fret over the situation. If you need to grieve, grieve later. But right now, run. When God opens a door for you to get out of an ungodly, messed up situation, run. No good can come of lingering. Number four, when God gives us a chance to get away from the destruction, get all the way out. When you're at a crossroads and God opens a door for you to go, go and go all the way. Don't, stay up, don't stop on the edge of the city. Don't stop on the edge of the situation. Ladies, delete his number. That or change his name to whatever and block it. Get a new phone number. Move. What, whatever it takes to do. Guys, <laughs> we'll talk later. Y'all, <laughs> we'll talk Wednesday. Get out. <laughs> get out. Sometimes it's just time to get out. Sometimes it's time to go. Don't stop halfway. If God sets you free from a situation, it's a messed up situation. Hey, listen. If you're in a business partnership with somebody who's a thief, a crook, and a liar, and is doing illegal stuff, and is going to get you messed up, but you making money in the situation, sometimes it's time to cut your losses and get out because they will drag you down with them. Get all the way out. If you're in business, two or three things, sell them all. Get all the way out. You'll get pulled in. And number five, once I'm out, don't look back. Don't look back. Listen, it's not as good as you remember. It's not as good as you remember. Sometimes we get out of situations, we remember them more fondly than they were. There's nothing back there in that situation for me but death. There's nothing back there but death. Don't return to my past mistakes. It can only be a